Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Cybersecurity Weekly. I'm your host, Fred Cobb, Vice President of Services and Chief Information Security Officer for InfoSystems. To my right, Mr. Josh Davis, Vice President of Marketing here at InfoSystems. Josh, thank you for joining me on today's discussion. You're welcome. How's it going? It's going well. Going well. So awesome. uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, this particular topic doesn't get a lot of press. But it's uh, near and dear to my heart, being a, a cybersecurity professional and looking at things that you can do as a business owner, as an individual, as far as getting the most bang for your buck when it comes to trying to secure your environment. And uh, the topic for today is application whitelisting. And we'll talk a little bit about whitelisting in general and maybe some blacklisting um, items as well. But really the concept of application whitelisting is pretty simple. It's just the idea that my machine, either the server or my endpoint, uh, let's focus on endpoint devices for today's discussion. Sure. But my, my laptop, my, uh, my desktop, will only run a program that has been approved and is part of a list that is controlled by a system administrator. So culturally, that's a big deal. And here's, this is one reason why uh, that application whitelisting is maybe not as popular um, as it should be. <laughs> because if you think about the way a ransomware attack uh, comes into an environment, manifests itself, detonates, wreaks havoc. You could eliminate virtually all of that. I won't say all, but I'll say a large percentage of ransomware type attacks if you had a real strict whitelisting policy. But, but the reason why it's a cultural shift is because you're taking the ability of the user in a lot of cases to decide what software they want to run, want to allow to have run on their system, and you're placing that in the hands of the system administrator that's responsible for determining these are the business applications you need to run and or these are the URLs you can surf when you go web browsing and that's it. Yeah. So it, it is this idea of big brother control but again it, as far as protecting a business owner's environment uh, protecting you from all the nasty things that are out there with different variants of malware, ransomware, trojans, worms, things we've talked about in previous episodes uh, this is one of the best things you can do. So, uh, and people might ask, okay, well, shouldn't it be easy to defeat application whitelisting? Let's say I've got um, a piece of malware that I've developed because I'm a criminal, criminal, excuse me, and I want to wreak some havoc somewhere. So I just call it something benign. I'll call it calc.exe. That's the program when you fire up calculator on a Windows box. Hmm. So uh, I go in and I replace Calc EXE with my nasty software called Calc EXE and someone fires up calculator, what would prohibit that from running? Well, what happens is there's a mathematical hash associated that uh, and it really um, proves the integrity of a particular application. So whenever you launch Calc.exe, that hash is compared against a known hash for Calc.exe that's published by the vendor. If I've created my nasty software and I call it calc.exe, the hash doesn't match the true program that's out there. It would be uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Never say never, yeah. but extremely difficult to match the hash and truly bypass uh, the protection mechanism and software hashing to actually run that nasty software. So it's more than just changing the name. But, but think about it, Mo most malware, let's say I'm a user, and something comes in, hey, click on these pics are the best thing ever. So I, cl I click on the pics, nothing happens, and then that afternoon all those uh, files on the file server start getting encrypted. And we're doing all the forensics. We bring in an outside company, and they bring in info systems to look at what's going on. It's determined, yes, you've got malware. Uh, here's patient zero. It happened on this machine this time of day. Imagine if you could eliminate, even if someone clicked on hey, look at these pics, are the best thing ever. And the malware downloaded, when it tried to run, it wouldn't be successful in running because of application whitelisting. I can see how there's a pretty good benefit to that. Absolutely. Uh, if, it, if there's one thing, uh, you know, my top five, I'd have to be number one, I think, as far as uh, good endpoint security. And there's lots of vendors out there that uh, have whitelisting solutions. Most of your uh, well-known antivirus vendors, your trends, uh, your Kaspersky's, uh, they have tools built in for that. Uh, there is some native application whitelisting tools. AppLocker, as an example, 
in Windows 10. Comes with the operating system. Has it been defeated in a while? Yes. So the native application whitelisting is not always as great as something more enterprise ready. One of my favorites is uh, Carbon Black. Mm. Carbon Black has been around a long, long time. Application whitelisting in general has been around for several years. Yeah. But uh, Carbon Black is one of the best. They're well known for um, the, the program that they sell uh, to provide really a, a nice envelope around the operating system, around the applications to uh, help uh, to eliminate uh, software mimicking, software that's allowed to run. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with the Cybersecurity Weekly Podcast after we pause for this special message. Security analysts believe cyber attacks will continue to escalate throughout 2020 and are recommending that every company, regardless of industry or size, place immediate focus on cybersecurity training and tools that will protect you from these attacks. Did you know that you can book a cybersecurity assessment right now with Fred Cobb's team of cybersecurity engineers at InfoSystems? They will help you discover exactly where you are most vulnerable to a cyber attack and make recommendations on how to strengthen your defense in those areas. This is urgent. It's an issue that affects everyone in our community. Visit the InfoSystems website at www.infosystems.biz to request your cybersecurity assessment. Now back to the podcast. I got to do some uh, kind of a behind the scenes take here. Before we started recording this episode, you told me that uh, you weren't sure that you could make this topic real interesting, even though it's really interesting to you because you're, <laughs> you're so into cybersecurity. Right. It might not be as interesting to business people. Now, I disagree. When I hear you talk about this, you, you've got me engaged. I'm interested to know more. So I think you're doing a good job so far. Oh, that's good to hear. That's good <laughs> to hear. But uh, let's talk about, again, I mentioned it twice already. Let's talk about it again, the cultural idea of that. So uh, a lot of times we'll talk to, uh, you know, going in as uh, uh, consultants doing cybersecurity work for different companies. We'll go in and say, "Hey, here's here's a good bang for your buck," and the um, the business owner will, you know, they'll think about, "Well, what's this going to do to my employee morale?" Okay, uh, think about that for a minute because if your employee morale is such that you're allowing local administrative access to let them install software and run it at their leisure, whatever they want to run, then you're really setting yourself up for, if you haven't been hit already by an attack, a cyber attack, uh, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, perimeter security can only go so far. When I say perimeter, things like firewalls, mm -hmm. um, things like uh, uh, deception tools such as Packet Viper, things of that nature, they do a really good job. But if your mindset and your culture is, I want my employees to have local admin, it eases a burden on me because I have a limited uh, technology workforce, I need them out there having those rights, you got to really weigh uh, the cost benefit of that versus something terrible happening because you're allowing that to that level of access to be in your environment and there, there's kind of a sliding scale that i think you're mm -hmm. referring to here where the more controls you place on something the more difficult it becomes to use for the end user just because they have fewer freedoms right so the more that control the more it slides towards giving the end user ultimate control over their devices the more freedom they have to do whatever they want without having to answer to anybody you know so the control slides back and forth and you know nobody pretend we're talking about health if i went to my nutritionist and told them hey i want to live really healthy and make sure my body functions perfectly uh, so can you craft a diet for me to eat it may not be the diet that i really want to eat right, right. but it's going to be for optimal health Conversely, if I want to eat all the junk, you know, just feed my taste buds whatever they want and eat all the junk, my, my body is going to suffer because of that if I eat a terrible diet. So, you know, just relating that to the world of cybersecurity, I think that's what we've sort of been talking about here. The control has to be with the cybersecurity team setting global policies for the organization. The end users need to be limited in what they can and can't do. but 
that sliding scale <clears throat> is going to be different from company to company based on their you know unique setup. It absolutely will be. If you take a let's say a, a banking environment where um, think about your bank tellers when you walk into an average bank, they're sitting there, they they're running the applications necessary to uh, serve the customer base, checking, savings, talking about what's in their money market, things like that, where they'll defer you to someone that's in one of the back offices. They may be running a slightly uh, greater number of applications to serve uh, those particular clients, but do they really need to have uninhibited access to the web? Do they need to have uninhibited access to any software they want to install? Probably not. That's a very controlled environment. Um, where I, you know, I've worked in uh, or done consulting work in media, like television stations and and uh, radio stations. They feel like uh, if they put any type of restriction on their employees, it affects their creative thinking process. So they yeah. want to have the ability to do unfettered surfing or to install any program that they want. So you have to think about, well, in that environment, what can I do? Can I do some sort of controlled lockdown without taking away the artistic creativity. So you may have to put more thought into it, but you can still arrive usually at a place where you've got good balance between what you allow your employees to do and what you just simply mandate that they cannot do. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think that a company should look to this as a, an alternative to uh, maybe just the basic antivirus or the basic policy or the uh, the basic idea of pulling away administrative access, I think they should build on that by also uh, putting some sort of whitelisting technology on their network to, to uh, help thwart those things that get in. Because think about a firewall. If a firewall is allowing me access to the internet, which most firewalls do, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let's say I've got local admin on my box, let's say port 80, which is standard HTTP out to a URL, that particular port is allowing me outbound, I can go out there and grab something nasty, even though all the other firewall ports, everything may be locked down tight. Now it's come into my computer, I can unleash it on the network. Mm. Okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's very important to have that additional application layer control in addition to what you're doing with your perimeter. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I've got just a minute here. I want to touch on the idea of uh, whitelisting also URLs mm -hmm. or whitelisting email versus blacklisting. Um, so think of the application whitelisting concept that we talked about. Apply that to what uh, web type surfing you can do. There's plenty of surf control technologies out there as well that uh, by default there may be black uh, listing or blocking uh, certain sites, whether it's pornographic, it may be gun sites, it may be things that are um, you know, some of the more volatile type uh, rhetoric that's happening out there, you may build uh, policies in place to block that type of access. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies, um, they still consider that an infringement on their employees' right to surf the web. So, yeah. But you, you have to, again, you have to weigh what you're going to allow the employees to do versus what you're going to block. And uh, it, it, it is extremely hard, just one second on blacklisting, uh, a lot of times um, will get called into situations where uh, a system on a uh, company network may be employed by a spam bot to, if it's running SMTP, um, could be bouncing spam emails and not even know it. All of a sudden, that particular business's SMTP server is getting blacklisted. Their email domain is getting blacklisted. It's extremely difficult um, once you become blacklisted to get off that list. Uh, what happens is, one of the things, if you're blacklisted, you can't send emails. Yeah. So it's important to, uh, uh, I know we're getting a little bit off topic from application whitelisting, but it's very important to make sure that you're on top of uh, looking at your SMTP service. Is it healthy? Is someone using it as a spam bot and you don't even know about it? But uh, uh, pay particular attention to that as well. Yeah, I know earlier this year, I received some email from a local company that I guess I'm on their mailing list or something like that. And it was a a spam email where their email account had been compromised and I assume this message got blasted out to every contact in their mm -hmm. uh, database and I'm sure it contained some malware or something like that but I reached out to the company that it happened to because I you know I wanted to let them know first of all they need to check out their email system but 
if that goes on, then like you say, their their email could be sort of permanently or, or significantly uh, blacklisted on the public internet mm -hmm. and uh, prevent them from just sending out regular email communication. So, you know, that's something that you definitely need to keep in check because it can have pretty bad consequences for your company. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's all we got for today. Thanks everyone for joining in and we got uh, more uh, cybersecurity topics on the horizon to talk with you about and we'll see you soon. Thank you.